Our first author is Jojo Moyes, and her new book is The Giver of Stars. It is a richly detailed and satisfying new novel starring Alice Wright, who leaves stuffy England to marry handsome American Bennett Van Cleve, but finds life not much better. She's landed in a small and standoffish Kentucky town in the midst of the Great Depression and must live under the same roof as her domineering father-in-law. Yeah, I know. Uh, then, while daydreaming at one of those interminable town meetings, she hears these fateful words, what in the Sam Hill is a traveling library anyway? You know, despite what her husband says and his uh, total disapproval, Alice immediately joins the Horseback Librarians. It's an actual program that was promoted by um, Eleanor Roosevelt, and she is joining other librarians and bringing books and magazines to the far-flung residents of their surrounding area. Women deliver the books. They're the librarians, and they're led by tough and irrepressible Marjorie O'Hare, who is the daughter of the local moonshiner, which, and which comes in handy sometimes. Uh, and they persevere despite minor threats to their mission like bad weather and social opprobrium and one much graver challenge. The heart of the book is in fact the close relationship among the women who ride. Now to sum up this book, I'm going to quote from its editor who's sitting right here, Pamela Dorman, who said something really wonderful about it at our recent day of dialogue. If someone had told me I would fall in love with a novel about a group of librarians on horseback in Depression-era Appalachia, I would have told them that they were nuts. But I never thought I would fall in love with a book about an arrogant quadriplegic and a local girl who becomes his carer. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Jojo Moyes. Thanks so much for inviting me to your event. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for my wardrobe choices, which may make me appear as a disembodied head to you. Um, it, yeah, there's not much to look at. Um, yeah, so I don't really need to say much about the plot of the book, uh, but I'll tell you how it came about. Um, I was casting around reading the whole of the internet, as writers are prone to do before we start work in the morning, and I found an article in the Smithsonian Magazine about the, the Pack Horse Librarians of Kentucky. And this was an extraordinary thing, and I, I was really struck by the images that went with the picture of these fierce young women um, immaculately dressed in this kind of bleak and rough landscape of the Kentucky mountains. Uh, but determined, that, you know, they rode up to 140 miles a week, often through really difficult conditions. Sometimes they would get off their horses and, and just walk the rest of the way, but they were so determined to bring books to people who wouldn't otherwise even learn to read. Now, this was set up uh, by Roosevelt under the WPA because he felt that after the Depression, families were falling prey to snake oil salesmen and religious fundamentalism. So I can't imagine what resonated with me um, when I read about that. But it just felt to me, uh, with its uh, story of female friendship and, and the kind of vague political backdrop that it had such resonance for today that it was a story I immediately wanted to write and I had that thing that you sometimes get as a writer where you feel immediately proprietorial about something uh, and I pretty much booked my ticket to Kentucky immediately because being English <laughs> and writing about Appalachia uh, <laughs> feels like quite a big leap so I spent I, I took three trips out there I lived in a tiny cabin on a mountainside of a distant holler, uh, seven miles up a dirt track. Uh, the house had no locks on the doors, uh, a toilet behind a curtain. <laughs> that was interesting. Um, and it was run by a fantastic woman called Barbara Napier, uh, to whom this book will be dedicated, who is 72 years old and uh, set up her system of cabins in this holler when her marijuana crop failed to work two years in a row. <laughs> and. This book is infused with her spirit uh, because what I discovered when I first went to Kentucky is that they are storytellers. I mean, you know, it is a place of huge extremes, great charm, and even the kind of the people I met who I might not normally feel comfortable walking past on a dark night, they were charming, they were funny, they had the best stories. Um, and in fact, if you don't mind cursing, I'm going to tell you one of Barbara's stories. Uh, am I right to curse? Yeah. Yeah, because I can't tell this story without cursing. Okay. Um, so Barbara uh, basically bought what she thought was going to be 350-acre marijuana farm um, when her husband ran off with her best friend, leaving her with two small children. 
And I said to her, and you're going to have to excuse my American accent, you know, Barbara, how, how long did it take you to get over that? And she said, oh, honey, I just about cried every day for eight years. And I went, OK, uh, well, how did you survive? Because she had to pull her own water, she had to grow her own vegetables, and she had two babies. And she said, oh, I was so tired. She said, one day, I just went outside and I laid down in the grass and I thought, I can't do this no more. And she said, and then I opened my eyes, and she said, and there was this mountain lion looking at me. <laughs> yeah. We don't usually get stories like this in England. <laughs> and she said, um, I said, what did you do? She said, well, she was big as a table. She said, and I knew she had young because I'd, w I'd been watching her through my binoculars. She said, so I lay there for a minute thinking, oh my God, the gun's in the house, the kids are in the house, what am I gonna do? I said, what did you do? She went, well, she said, I was so tired. She said, I just sat up and I went, oh, fuck off. <laughs> and I said, what did the lion do? She went, she fucked off. <laughs> she said, I never saw her again. <laughs> And if you excuse the cursing, that to me was the spirit of those women. Like, they just, they were too tired to take that nonsense and she just got on with it. Um, anyway, she went on to thrive and she's made this fantastic business. Uh, and I, I met her and I spoke to her guests and I found that every meal time that you have with her is two hours of storytelling. And that rhythm of language, I hope, is infused in the book. I, I had... Um, my first reader was Barbara because I knew she wouldn't mince her words in telling me if I'd got anything wrong. And luckily, there were very few changes that she asked me to make. But mostly I wanted to write this book because I wanted to write a book about women supporting other women uh, because I find that too often in our modern day narratives in entertainment, we're told that women must necessarily be in competition with each other and that's not my experience. Um, I wanted to write a book about women with agency. I wanted to write a w book about women who were capable and doing something rather than just kind of thinking about their relationships or worrying about what they wore. Um, and I also wanted to write a book about a woman of certain years having really good sex with someone that liked her. Um, which again, I don't feel I see enough of in entertainment. Um, so it's that, it's a whodunit, it's a big, uh, a big read. Um, I fell in love with Kentucky, which is not a phrase I ever expected to utter as a woman. Um, and I really hope that you enjoy it too if you read it. Uh, I can give you a little bit of exciting news, which was yesterday it was announced that Universal Pictures is, is making a movie of it. Um, thank you. Uh, and that obviously doesn't often happen before the book has even been edited. So I feel like I'm hoping there is an appetite for this kind of story. Um, and I loved writing it. I loved writing it more than anything I've ever written. I wrote it in what we in England call a muck sweat. Uh, it took me nine months, even with the research. Um, and thank you in advance. I hope your readers enjoy it too. Thank you.